up everyone welcome back to mad medicine in this video we're going to be discussing eating disorders now if you guys don't already know on our youtube channel you can find a playlist for the usmle step one video so just go check out our channel and you'll find psych videos on a playlist and don't forget to like comment and subscribe to our channel when you guys are there so with that being said, let's start with an overview of eating disorders. Now, these are mental disorders that are defined by an abnormal eating habit. And this abnormal eating habit has a negative effect on a person's whole life, both physically and mentally. We're going to talk about that in a second. So this is a multifactorial uh, disease or disorder that we're dealing with. Now, it usually occurs in adolescents or at a very young age, and it's more common in females than it is in males on the USMLE step one often it will be a female who gets presented in the vignette not, not always but often so there are four types we're going to be talking about today which are anorexia nervosa bulimia nervosa binge eating and pica now with that being said let's start our conversation with anorexia which is probably the most complex of all of these diseases so we're going to knock out the, the big the heavy hitter first uh, and then we're going to continue on to the next disorders. So this, in anorexia, you're going to have an intense fear of gaining weight. And I'm sure a lot of you guys already know what anorexia is, but these patients have a disordered perception of their body image. They restrict their caloric intake because of that disordered perception. And this leads to severe weight loss. And the hallmark for anorexia is going to be a BMI that is less than 18.5. So I'm going to draw an arrow, arrow and write high yield as fuck, or, you know, the acronym for it right next to it because this is a key giveaway for anorexia. They may present you uh, I, on the USMLA step one, they may pres present a vignette that's very similar to bulimia, exactly the same except for the BMI. If the BMI is less than 18.5, you are dealing with a patient who have anorexia. If a BMI is even 18.6, 18.7, it is a bulimic patient and that's the key hallmark for anorexia. So we're going to write this up here one more time for you guys so you never forget this 18.5 that's very very important don't ever forget this okay so in this case patients with such a low bmi are going to be uh, at an increased risk for mortality due to malnourishment and you can see right here here's an anorexic patient all her bones are so easily visible if you look at your back you cannot see your ribs maybe if you stretch a little you may see you know some of the indentations from your ribs or the intercostal spaces but in this case man you can clearly point out exactly where her ribs are and where the intercostal spaces are which is pretty crazy you know to see that uh, you can also see her pelvic bones easily and her spine and the spine's processes so so easily right there so uh, clearly it's a very very skinny person this is often associated with other illnesses as are all of these disorders they're usually associated with anxiety depression o ocd ptsd i forgot to write in this in there but body dysmorphic disorder is very commonly associated with these diseases and uh, usually the illness improves with weight restoration now we're going to talk about what can happen what can go wrong with weight restoration in a little bit but just know it this is very easily managed if you can restore their weight to a normal and healthy BMI now the symptoms for anorexia include having decreased bone density due to low estrogen and high cortisol because you have low fat uh, fat pads around your stomach or in the abdomen or uh, they're not going to be producing estrogen as much as they would at the same time because of the constriction in calories the cortisol levels are going to be very high and uh, it puts the body in a very very uh, fight or flight mode and that can lead to chronically uh, having decreased bone density which is you know seen with osteoporosis or osteopenia you may have a presentation of a female who has uh who's really young but is presenting with multiple fractures or you may see uh, multiple fractures at different stages of healing yes that could be you know uh, abuse as well but you definitely want to look at the weight to rule out anorexia or an eating disorder now, another thing that can happen is amenorrhea, especially in a female that's a very hallmark uh, presentation for anorexia. This is due to the decreased GnRH that's not being produced anymore. Uh, patients will also present with lanugo. And if you guys don't know, lanugo are these fine hairs on a baby, right? You can normally see them on a child. That's normal uh, for a child to have them. But when you're an adult and if you just look at your arm, uh, the hairs on our arms aren't fine, right? They're very uh, coarse, they're thick, and you can distinctly tell where the hairs are. 
are. With Lanugo, they're very fine, very brittle, very soft hairs, which are not present on adults. So that's a key giveaway. I'm going to put a star next to it. Uh, because of restricting your diet, you will have bone marrow suppression naturally, and this will lead to anemia and pancytopenia. And finally, electrolyte disorders will also occur, leading to bradycardia and hypotension. Now, there are two main subtypes you need to be uh, aware of when it comes to anorexia. The first is a binge eating and purging type. This is very similar to bulimia, and we're going to talk about that in a bit. But uh, in the binge eating and purging type, a patient is going to recurrently purge uh, the food they eat. They're going to binge eat, and then they're going to purge. They're going to eat a lot, and they're going to purge. And this could be through a laxative, through diuretics, or this could be through self-induced vomiting. Okay, um, And what's going to end up happening is they're going to be doing this for three months, at least three months. Now, this is different than bulimia because in this case, they're going to have a BMI that is less than 18 Point five. Their weight is going to be abnormally low. So that's the key giveaway. Always, always, always. If it looks like bulimia, it could be until you look at the BMI. BMI less than 18.5, it is anorexia nervosa, the binge eating and purging type of anorexia nervosa. Now, the second type is a restriction type. So in this type, they're not going to be uh, eating or they're not going to be binge eating and purging. They're going to be restricting their, in, their caloric intake by dieting, by fasting, or by over-exercising. People don't think about that, and I didn't either the first time. But when you think about it logically, if you are working out so much for five hours a day, six hours a day, uh, and you're running and you're exercising so much, but you're not eating enough to replenish your ner- your, your the calories you've burned, you're going to have a caloric deficiency. And it's great to lose weight, but after a while, it becomes a malnourishment for you to do so much. You become malnourished. So uh, in the restricting type, a patient who presents with a BMI less than 18.5 could be eating normally, but they could be supplementing uh, their normal caloric you know, intake for a normal person by over-exercising by diet, by, or by fasting. Um, that can also be a thing. So that is the restriction type. There's no recurrent purging behavior or binge eating that happens for the course of three months. Now, they still have to overexercise or diet or fast excessively for uh, the last three months. Okay, that's still a key hallmark for anorexia, uh, irregardless of the type, the subtype we're talking about. Now, one thing that can happen from refeeding someone, uh, and keep in mind that's what we said earlier, is by nutrient replenishment, you can treat anorexia. One thing that can happen is you can have something called the refeeding syndrome, and that's very important specifically when it comes to anorexia nervosa. This can happen. Uh, So what happens is when you start to uh, give someone nutrient rehabilitation, you're going to give them... Uh, uh, an increased amount of caloric intake, especially in someone who is malnourished. Now, because they're increasing their caloric intake, they're going to have an increased production of insulin, right? That makes sense. Normally, their body isn't producing insulin because of the fact that they're not eating much. Now they're eating, their body senses, oh, we're getting some calories, we need to produce insulin. When they produce insulin, they're going to become hypophosphatemic. So, Insulin is going to lead to decrease in their phosphate level. Phosphate stores are going to go down. Now, their phosphate stores are already depleted because of the fact that they're malnourished. Now, you are giving them insulin. They're going to become even more malnourished in phosphate. Okay, so that's going to be double. This is going to decrease their production of ATP. Why are they going to decrease the production of ATP? Because ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. Three phosphates are on the adenosine uh, molecule. If you don't have phosphate to begin with, you can't make ATP. So the, even though they're having a normal caloric intake, uh, they're not going to be able to convert those calories into ATP. That's very, very important. And that's all because of hypophosphatemia. Another thing that can happen is hypokalemia. Insulin is going to induce decrease of uh, um, their potassium the potassium stores, excuse me, as well as their magnesium stores. Now, if you guys don't know this already, magnesium and potassium stores are very closely linked. If one goes down, the other one's going to go down. If magnesium's low, potassium is going to be low, and you can't fix potassium before fixing magnesium. So magnesium and potassium stores are both going to be low, and because they're both going to be low, you're going to be dealing with cardiac complications, 
Both of these are very important for the heart. Uh, you might deal with rhabdomyolysis, right? That could also occur, as well as seizures because of these electrolyte imbalances. Now, most fatalities in the refeeding syndrome, especially the anorexia nervosa, are going to be caused by cardiac issues. That makes sense because these two uh, electrolytes up here, these two components are very important for your heart. Okay, if you don't have them, the heart isn't going to be able to function properly. You're going to have a bradycardia caused by the hypokalemia, as well as arrhythmias. Arrhythmias can also occur. And one thing that can occur with a significantly low heart rate is going to be torsade de Pons, and that usually occurs with a decreased potassium uh, storage amount. This can also lead to poor contractility and low stroke volume, which can end up causing uh, systemic issues in the body. Right, because not enough blood is getting there. So the treatment for this is very simple. You have to slow the refeeding. You can't give them uh, a big amount of calories, a large amount of calories, and expect the problem to go away. You need to slowly titrate their caloric intake to increase. Uh, other things will also help, but once you uh, do a gentle increase, you won't be dealing with the refeeding syndrome. So that is anorexia nervosa. It's very simple uh, overall, but it's the most complicated of all of these eating disorders. Now we're going to talk about bulimia nervosa. Bulimia is a binge eating disorder with recurrent inappropriate compensatory mechanisms. What that means is patients are going to binge eat and then they're going to compensate for the fact that they binge ate. They're going to eat a lot and then they're going to do something like purging or vomiting. That's very, very common. They may even use laxatives to induce a quick, you know, a quick depositing or sorry, quick emptying of their their body because they don't want the they don't want to intake all the calories. Uh, absorb them, or they can also end up fasting after they binge eat. So let's say they binge eat and then they don't eat for a whole day. Then they'll binge eat and then they don't eat. They can also excessively exercise, right? We talked about this. Anorexia and uh, bulimia are so common in so many ways. Uh, so that shouldn't surprise you. Now, this should happen at least once a week for three months. That's the key giveaway. Once a week for three months, similar to anorexia. And uh, these patients end up having an uh, overvaluation of their body image. What they think is that they're really fat, that uh, they're overweight, even though they're not. This is also very closely associated with body dysmorphic disorder, as well as other types of OCD uh, uh, behavioral disorders. It's also associated with ADHD, uh, sorry, PTSD, OCD in general, um, and uh, anxiety etc etc so they're like i said they're very closely associated with all these other psychiatric disorders now um one other thing to keep in mind is that weight in bulimia is usually going to be normal because of the fact that they are compensating for the binge eating now they're not compensating to the amount that anorexic patients are compensating right because in anorexic patients the bmi is less than 18.5 in bulimia the bmi is going to be greater than or equal to 18.5 okay it's going to be greater than or equal to 18.5 it's not going to be less than when it's less than 18.5 you have anorexia so if you see a patient with this uh, uh, symptoms with this presentation look at their BMI that will give you a good clue if it's anorexia or bulimia now, when it comes to bulimia, the clinical symptoms are going to include peritiditis because these patients are usually purging so much that their parotid glands are going to become inflamed. This is going to lead to enamel erosion because the high acidic content of the stomach uh, fluid that's going to be coming up and they're going to be throwing up, so it's going to erode their enamel. Russell signs, which are scars on the knuckles, are going to be present like this right here. These are Russell signs. You see how the the scar has fibrosis and has, uh, the knuckle has fibrosis and scarring. This is because they're using their knuckles to induce vomiting. Uh, and then when it comes to lab findings, these patients are going to have a contraction alkalosis because of the reduction in uh, you know body water, total body water, due to the vomiting and purging. That's going to lead to contraction alkalosis, uh, and because they're purging stomach content, they're also going to be reducing the amount of uh, acid they have, leading to the alkalosis to begin with. This will also lead to electrolyte imbalances like we talked about, loss of potassium. Uh, remember, alkaline alkalosis means you're going to lose potassium to begin with. And then the urinary chloride is going to be very low, very low. It's usually higher in other causes of alkalosis, but because this is contraction alkalosis, 
the chloride levels are going to be very low. That's a key giveaway. Now, the treatment for this is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy to help the patient understand that their body is normal, that they have a healthy body, as well as nutrient rehabilitation. That's the first sign. You can also give SSRIs, of course, to treat any underlying cause like OCD or you know body dysmorphic disorder, et cetera, et cetera. You can use those SSRIs. But the mainstay of bulimia and anorexia is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy uh, combined with nutrient rehabilitation. So next, we're going to be talking about binge eating disorders. Now, in the binge eating disorder, this is very similar to bulimia, except for the fact that there's no compensatory mechanism. They're binge eating, but they're not going to do anything to prevent uh, the weight gain. They're just going to take it. They're not going to compensate. And that's why we have this photo right here, someone who just eats a lot. Now, there's a lack of purging, and when it comes to it, the patient feel like they don't have any control of what they're doing. They know they're eating a lot, they understand that, but they don't have any self-control. Now, this will also lead to fast eating and an increased weight. So they're going to be overweight. That is a clear giveaway. A patient who's going to be overweight and who eats a lot is binge eating. That's the key giveaway. Now, they're going to have an increased risk of diabetes simply because of the fact of what they are eating and how much they're eating and their weight. Uh, and it's going to coexist with other illnesses like depression and anxiety, just like the other two, anxiety, uh, with anorexia and bulimia nervosa. This is usually going to occur at least once a week for three months, same timeline. And the treatment for this is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy, the first line to help control their behavior. And then secondly, you can also use SSRIs to treat the underlying illness that coexists. And you can use a drug called lisdexamethasone. Lis lisdexamethasone, that's a mouthful, uh, is a ADHD stimulate, stimulant that decreases binge eating episodes by reducing appetite. So that's also one thing that can be used for binge eating, but that's later down the road. Now finally, we have pica. Pica is when someone has recurrent episodes of eating non-food substances like dirt or hair for at least one month, okay? If they're eating dirt, hair, and keep in mind, ice chips is a classic example on step one. For greater than a month, they're probably suffering from pica. This is not cultural or developmentally recognized as normal. This is completely abnormal across the board, and this may provide temporary emotional support for someone who's going through a very stressful period, so keep that in mind. Now, um, this is very common in childhood and in pregnancy. Why is it common in pregnancy? Because this is associated with malnourishment, heavily associated with malnourishment. And in pregnancy, you're not just eating for one, you're eating for two people practically. So because the, the fetus is going to be leaching nutrients from the mother, the mother can become malnourished very quickly. And that can lead to pica. Other causes of malnourishment are anemia, sorry, other causes of pica, not malnourishment, other causes of pica are anemia, developmental disabilities can also cause it, as well as emotional trauma. Now, when it comes to treatment, the first sign is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy. You also can give uh, SSRIs to treat any underlying cause as well as the pica itself. Now, when it comes to these eating disorders, it's good to just get an overview and just review everything we've talked about. There's a lot, but they're very simple. Let's talk about anorexia. Anorexia, you're in anorexia, you're going to have a lack of caloric intake leading to someone being underweight, right? So BMI is going to be less than 18.5, which I've written right here too, but I just wanted to write it twice so, so you guys can see it. Hallmark things to watch out for. Refeeding syndrome, hypophosphatemia. Very, very important. Hypo hypophosphatemia as well as hypokalemia and uh, any other electrolyte imbalances across the board will happen in any eating disorder issues. This, They can also have cardiac issues, which is the main cause of death, and malnourishment. Sorry, let's go back. All right, now when it comes to bulimia, this is a binge eating disorder. They're going to be eating a lot, but they are going to have compensatory mechanisms, which leads them to have a normal weight. It's not going to be overweight. They're not going to be underweight. They're going to be normal in their weight class. But they're going to have purging and vomiting that's associated with uh, their, their binge eating. They're going to also have contraction alkalosis because they're contracting their total body volume by throwing up as well as losing uh, acidic uh, uh, volume in their body. They're losing acidity 
by throwing up their stomach content. And they're also going to have low urinary chloride, and this is probably a key important distinguishing factor for bulimia uh, when it comes to purging and vomiting. Now, for both of these, anorexia and bulimia, first-line treatment is cognitive behavioral therapy and nutrient rehabilitation. You can also use SSRIs for any underlying issues. In binge eating disorder, they're going to eat a lot. They're going to have binge eating. They're going to be overweight for sure because there are no uh, compensatory mechanisms like purging. These patients are going to have lack of self-control. That's very important. They're going to eat really fast, putting them at a higher uh, weight, increasing their weight, and putting them at higher risk for diabetes. The treatment for this is SS, uh, CBT for a sign. You can give SSRIs or an ADHD stimulant called lisdexamethasone. Now, finally, we have pica, in which the patient will eat normally. It's, this isn't really an eating disorder per se, but um, and their weight is going to be normal. But the key giveaway is that these patients are going to be eating random food substances, non-food substances, sorry, like uh, dirt or ice chips. Uh, first line for this is going to be cognitive behavioral therapy, but you can also use SSRI. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching our video on eating disorders. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And also, you can find these lectures on your favorite podcast service for free. So just go and search Mad Medicine.